What's up, everybody? I'm the Mangoos. You are awesome, and we are going to sit down today and talk about things that Overprime can improve upon. I think we both had quite a bit of fun with the game, and we both enjoyed it a lot, but there were things, there were some problems with the game that I think that they need to fix before they go into early access. And back by popular demand it is the Viking Jedi. You guys loved him on uh, For the Minions, and we're going to be working together quite a bit. So, uh, Jedi, just go ahead and introduce yourself a bit, man. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yep, again, I, I am the Viking Jedi. Um, me and Mangoose uh, became mutual friends through our buddy Jelly Knees, uh, so who you guys all should be familiar with. And, uh, yeah, I've been enjoying uh, getting to hang out and play some games together and uh, found a lot more, um, you know, mutual connections than I think we anticipated. So, uh, yeah. yeah, no, but it's been a blast. Yeah, really enjoyed the game. It's It's been it's been a lot of fun. Well, let's get right into it. Um, now, personally, I think their biggest problem, their biggest failing throughout the entire closed beta test was the item system. There just weren't enough items and there mm -hmm. weren't enough item types. Like um, it really made it and that fed into a lot of the other problems. Uh, what do you think about the item system and the, the well, the lack of items really? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, let's see. So I do think the items, the actual items they had in the game in themselves, and we've talked about this before. Uh, I think those were good. The items themselves, I think were built well. I think the scaling on the items were pretty decent. Um, but yeah, the overall like depth of items was, was really a problem. I felt like that there was a lot of like gaps that um, I feel like other items that were in there were way more niche than they needed to be. And then yeah, like there's very few, um, for example, like armor penetration items and the descriptions that they gave for the items and how they penetrate the armor and all that stuff wasn't very clear. So you didn't know if I build this item, what is it exactly doing to help me carve through some of these tanks if they, you know, and, and so forth. So I think um, that the, the lack of clarity sometimes on, on what the items did was was a big a failing, I guess, on their part, especially considering how important items are uh, in any MOBA, but let alone this one. Right, and I think a lot of that could be attributed to them being a Korean company, but that isn't sure. an excuse. They're a major company. Netmarble mm -hmm. is a billion-dollar company. It's the largest mm -hmm. mobile game company in Korea. They should have people that can take care of that stuff, that can that can do the interpretations and write these item descriptions. If they want to break into the Western market, they're mm -hmm. going to need to do that, and they need to, they need to clear up a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, you see the same thing in a lot of their ability descriptions and everything it wasn't mm -hmm. as bad this time like this closed beta test a lot of the descriptions were a lot were, were much better than the uh, first beta test like the first beta test they had rampage referring to rampage as she and her and stuff like rampage isn't a girl if rampage is a girl she'd be she would be topless just running around oh. you know what i mean you can't Some have those, that in the uh... game yeah, and some of the Bora outfits. I I'd love to see Rampage in those. That would be really funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I think there might be some things that are lost in translation, right? And uh, luckily for them, right, they do have the time to, to you know, get some of those things sorted out. But, um, of course, when you're trying to, you know, garner an audience, like you said, here in the West and, and trying to get um, people bought into your product, um, you know you're not the only one competing for eyes, um, you know, and you have a chance and they got a lot of good numbers, um, maybe more than they were expecting this time um, going around. But um, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing them put out something uh, kind of addressing those things, especially like the, some of the stuff I think we're going to go over. But, you know, talk about the items and the fact that, you know, maybe some of them were lacking and um, and what what their plans are for those things. But also, um, I hope that they've got together a PR team that is maybe based here in the West that is going to be communicating some of those issues um, and and concerns that I think the player base that uh, is here brought up or an EU that brought up. Right. Uh, and I think the, the lack of items also fed into another major problem that the community had. A lot of people felt that it was incredibly unbalanced. I think mm -hmm. that it was unbalanced. Like it wasn't balanced. It wasn't the balance wasn't great. But I think it would have been a lot better if we could have built items that could counter certain builds. Like, there was no um, healing negation. Uh, it's often called blight or trauma in other games. There was none sure. of that. You couldn't you, you couldn't negate healing. So when Ulog, or Narbash, whatever you want to call him, was introduced into the game, his healing was incredibly strong and incredibly strong. powerful. And you couldn't do anything about it because there was no item there to assist with that same with muriel muriel was incredibly 
incredibly strong in the game because there was no shield buster item. You often mm-hmm. see that in MOBAs as some sort of item that specifically deals extra damage to shields. And that just made Muriel just overpowered. Yeah, I know, and I agree. I think um, items in most MOBAs, but in a lot of games in general, they, they need to fit exactly what you're describing. They, they need to come from a place where um, maybe my kit in the character that I picked doesn't deal well with this character, but I should be able to opt into finding ways to deal with that character, right? That, so uh, exactly what you're mentioning. So if they have a lot of tanks, I should be able to buy items that helps me deal with tanks. Is it going to reduce my damage maybe in, in the quote-unquote meta optimum build? Probably, but I'm, I have a better chance of, you know, winning against that matchup if I feel like that's what it is. I think anytime you can give characters, or I'm sorry, players, um, the onus over their own character to feel like they can make choices that are meaningful and impactful in the game, um, and whether good or bad, maybe they make the wrong choice. If I'm itemizing with like, you know, um, a high crit, high damage build, that does nothing against tanks. They can itemize against me now, and now I, my damage as a carry means nothing to to helping me win the game. Whereas if I can buy, you know, again, armor shredding or anything like that, uh, now they have to try and counterplay around me being able to decimate their front line and they have to rearrange it and so i I feel like um and this is going to lead into what i think was the biggest thing but i think it starts to change the game from a a place of where it's like a a chess match into a checkers match um and i think items play a huge role in reducing the impact that i think smart players or people who are trying to keep themselves ahead of the curve um they just fail to be able to do so when items don't give them that that ability to make meaningful choices in game uh, around what the enemy picked. Right. 100% agreed. So on that topic, what did you think was the the biggest problem with Overprime? Uh so yeah, my I my I think it was most apparent uh in the tournament that you guys uh got to be part of. I think that it was really obvious that there is a big distinction between um way that I think the devs anticipated the game to be played and the way that the game was actually played. Yeah. Um the when when I think of like a MOBA game, I think of, you know, the the strategy that comes with MOBAs, five players or six players, you know, working together to accomplish a goal to be able to take down the enemy. Um, and I feel like in Overprime, you had people who were used to the old guard, the old way of doing it, whether they're, you know, former Paragon players or Fault players or, you know, maybe coming from different MOBAs, they have a general idea of of what it is that you're supposed to do to win a MOBA game. Overprime doesn't function like those other games. It has some of the same mechanics, but like there's no wave pushing in Overprime, at least not yet. A current version of Overprime does not have a good wave system. So managing waves doesn't really equate to anything. Um, neutral objectives, they're, you know, very, very strong early, become less strong, less relevant late. So if you pick a scaling champion and they play a game where they're going after neutral objectives, your scaling means nothing, you know? So if you're trying to stack your health by landing cues on, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name. Several uh, Demorius. Yeah, yeah Several Demorius. But you're trying, if you pick him because you want to scale and become this huge, healthy, you know, unstoppable force of, you know, missed demon thing, whatever he is, uh, you know, that won't happen if the Nexus is falling at eight or nine minutes. That right. That's, or the, you know, that that's just not, you're not going to be relevant. What you basically become a glorified minion that has an ult that can knock them back a little bit. Um, and, and I think that was, as the games started to come along, I saw more and more teams figuring out that that's how the game works, is that you can function very early take advantage of very early i mean our our group right our five man that's what we would do and we would stomp teams who didn't know didn't have a strategy right. to deal with us i mean we were ending games in, in under 10 minutes consistently 920 um, I, was our record i looked yeah. at, i looked at it today yeah it's it's ridiculous like i i feel like i mean i i'm all for a game going quicker like i so i you know i'm a um a league of legends player most times it sucks when I have like, you know, like maybe time for a game or two and then one game ends up taking an hour. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not fun. I, I feel like that's that just wears you out. You're exhausted afterwards. You don't want to play anymore. You might be tilted. Even if you win, you're still not exactly stoked on the way that the whole game went. So I get not wanting to have, you know, huge long games. But I, I'm I'm of a fan of where you get a chance to Again, play chess over checkers. You know, I don't want it to be where, you know, there's no strategy. It's just throw your head at this neutral objective, hope that the other team is lacking, or if you need to win the team fight, then you win the next team fight, and now the game's over. 
Um, so I think that, to me, from a gameplay, from a, from a big picture, they have a real problem, and I think they need to address it. They need to figure out what they want their identity to be in this space. Um, and if that's what they want, then what's the point of having scaling champions? What's the point in having items that don't really come online or the gold at this point where you can't get a full build until you're at 30 to 40 minutes in the game? So, like, they just would need to change their whole approach to, uh, I guess, finalizing what their, their concept is um, because it, otherwise it just feels disconnected. And I think a lot of players were feeling that. People in uh, your last video were mentioning that, that they just felt like the game felt more like a team deathmatch you know, rather than a MOBA that they're used to. Right. Um, and I do think that there's space for both, like, to feel a little bit faster, because we, I think we talked about that we liked that the pacing was a little bit higher. We liked that you felt like you could, you know, make some really cool moves and, and outplays, and some of the kits were really neatly designed that, you know, they changed from the old Paragon days. And so there, there's a lot going on that's good, but that part right there, the overall gameplay, the, str the, the thing that really is supposed to set you apart, is inconsistent and the player base doesn't know what to do with it, you need to find a way to address that right away. I think that's, to me, their biggest issue. And I think um, before they patched in, you know, halfway through, they patched the Orb Prime, the Prime Guardian that spawns to give it more health. I think True. before that patch, the game was far more fun and competitive. Yeah. After that, it became who can take Orb Prime the fastest. Mm -hmm. Because if you take it when it spawns, there's no possible way that an enemy team can defeat that thing. I don't think that was intended at all. Yeah, and it might not have been, right? And and also, again, we're, they, I guess, like, again, players are going to do things. They're always going to find ways to break your game. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what beta tests are for, right? Exactly. And, and so that's, I mean, obviously we're talking about it with this very small sample size, you know, but I am hopeful, right? Again, that they took, like, that tournament had to have been, um, you know, monumental data. They got, they got, you know, POVs. They got like, you know, actual concrete evidence of what a, a quote unquote competitive environment. So teams that are organized, not just like, you know, pickup games. That's what most of the beta was, was pickup right. games by people, right? Um, and so you want to see what your competitive looks like, but you also, you want to address what is it like for my single players? What is it like for my, my solo queue guys to queue in? and get matched up against a five stack who knows what they're doing versus and and what's that guy's outplay going to be like what's his experience going to be like and so uh, again i'm really looking forward to in the next few months as they kind of go through all the data and and stuff i want to see a pr release talking exactly about some of the stuff that i think we're bringing up today it's like okay so we saw these game times were wildly inconsistent we had games ending in eight minutes <laughs> and we had games ending in an hour and 20 minutes like what, what, where's the, where's, again, where's our identity as over prime? What is it that we want to do and where do we want to fit in this space? And I feel like any competitive environment needs to have that. Like you need it to, especially again, they're not the only ones in this space. We know the other competitors that are out there and some of them are way farther ahead and some of them are getting to watch what over prime does and say, Ooh, we need to make adjustments now before our next beta test so we can capitalize right. on what they failed. Um, and because there might not be enough mouths for all these, these companies, you know, I don't know too many players who are going to swap back and forth between these big companies. They're going to probably pick one and hope that it's the best one. And, and that's one thing that I really like that Overprime has been doing is I've said this a couple of times now, these Paragon remake companies need to use the Paragon fan base as kindling for the fire, not the, not mm -hmm. the fuel that's going to feed that fire in the long run. They need to use it to get the visibility and get up there, but then they need to start getting pulling players from Smite, League of Legends, or just people who have never played a MOBA before and are just interested in third-person games. That's what they need to do. Overprime is about the only one that's made like a very new, very different game. Mm -hmm. The other two games, Fault and Predecessor, are kind of just going to pull in the Paragon audience. Right. Um, and they're, they're doing a good job of it, and, and Paragon was a great game. Maybe that formula will be successful without Epic, you know, sticking their noses into the into it and and, and and messing it up. However, I think Overprime has a good thing going with with all the changes that they've made. And kind of rewinding back a little bit, sure. we're, we're talking about the the different strategies. Like Overprime, people were playing it like it was Paragon, and it's like and like I just said, it's not Paragon. Like it was not. It's almost unfair to call it a Paragon remake, even though they're using all those heroes and assets and everything. But sure. yeah, I think I thought I felt that it played more like Heroes of the Storm or mm -hmm. Gigantic than Paragon or League of Legends or something. It was it wasn't as much about 
winning your lane or pushing towers or anything. It was more about paying attention to camp timers and then mm-hmm. reacting accordingly. Because that's what you do in Heroes of the Storm. You're like, okay, yep. there's going to be this objective spawn. I'm going to go take this camp now. So it's pushing their lane and putting pressure on their lane while we take this objective. And that's kind of how we played over Prime was whenever the Prime Spirit Guardian was about to appear, that's when we would come gank duo lane, force them out, and then go take that Prime Spirit. Which um, I think the Prime Spirit also kind of is involved a little bit in the balance discussion, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back around to that. <laughs> but the, 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 the big difference is that, you know, mid middle of the, Middle of the closed beta test, they buff that or Prime Guardian. So, unlike Heroes of the Storm, you take that one objective, you win. You know, like, sure. Heroes of the Storm, you got to take a couple of objectives to win. No, you just had to employ your strategy one time and win in Overprime, which was a huge problem. A huge yeah. problem. I, I almost wonder with the, the buff, they, they felt like, you know, the games were going too long and they, they, that's not what they wanted. Um, and they knew people weren't like, I, I, my guess is this, that they, they, they did a quick look at the numbers. The average prime wasn't being taken until X time in game. Let's say, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes into the game, maybe even longer. Up over Much longer, minutes. I think. Yeah, right. So the, they, they could tell that the teams weren't giving it a priority. And um, I know for us, like, you know, granted, we're all a bunch of over the top nerds. And I mean, me and Jelly spent like a few hours talking about strategies and all kinds of stuff, trying to figure out like wh- how we wanted to approach this. Cause we just love that style of playing the game. We love game theory. Um, and I think a lot of your audience also loves game theory. So um, it, we took that to the, to the next level. We read the patch notes. We were like, okay, that's a huge buff. We need to get, we need to prioritize trying to get that bad boy right on spawn as best as we can. I mean, for the most part, once after the patch came through on our five sack, we rarely, rarely took the prime after 10 minutes. And it was very rare that we had a team uh, on the opposite side that was contesting us for that prime, right. you know, give, you know, even giving us a hard time about it. Um, and again, I think that was really just the devs not realizing that that would be the other side of it. It was that those savvy teams you know, the people who were paying attention, the people who want to be maybe in the more competitive space or, you know, take things to the next level are going to see something like that and go like, that's massive. How can I take advantage of it? And sure, average game times probably went way down, <laughs> like way down. Um, And again, I, I'm hopeful that the, the, the data points ex- ex- speak to that. They're going to look at it and go like, okay, we don't want eight minute games. Right. We don't want people queuing in and because... And, Let's be honest, the worst part about any MOBA is the first probably 10 minutes of the game. Do you know why? Because you're spending most of your time hitting minions and occasionally trading with your laner and blah, blah, blah. That's like the boring part. You, you want to get to the fun part. You want to get to the team fights. You want to get to that, you know, where you get to show your skill versus the other guy's skill. And um, you're not typically going to get that in under 10 minutes uh, when a game is right. ending because a big, huge uh, raid monster is, you know, busting through your your door. So, um, yeah, I agree that that's probably the the biggest thing that they'll, they'll hopefully have adjustments for. But I just think that they didn't expect it would be as aggressive as some of us right. would take it. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they gave it that huge health increase. And I think it they gave massive. it a, a damage increase, too. The problem was is people were taking it before. They were taking it so late into the game that it was just getting melted by the enemy team before it could do right. anything at all. Like, yeah. it was, it went from being not effective at all to overly effective. Right. And if I, it, it's an easy fix, just to have the prime scale minute by minute. Sure. Like, you know, you take it at eight minutes, it's got this much health and this much mm-hmm. power. And you, nine, you know, yeah, pretty, pretty easy fix, I think. And that's probably what they'll employ. I'm, I'm almost certain that that's what they'll do. I mean, I would take a guess that they would. I mean, um, our, our buddy Convey, who who does a lot of like coding and stuff like that, he talked about that. And um, from his perspective, he said it's probably one of the easier things that they can implement is a yeah. scaling um, aspect. Um, and speaking of scaling, I'd like to see that same thing applied to minions. Um, I, I think yes. the minion scaling, uh, and, and we I don't want to mean to deviate too much, but that was another one of the big issues that I felt like was that early on, Minions will 100 to zero you if you get caught in a wave on unexpectedly. Like at least for me as a, an 80 carry main, I was just surprised by how much damage I would take from from minions. Now, granted, as the game went on, I eventually outscaled them, and I was just you know it didn't matter. But the minions themselves never started from what I would consider a decent scaling, and that I think has a huge in- uh, issue with the overall gameplay aspect. Again, when we're talking about playing chess versus checkers, you want your minions to feel like reliable. 
as the game right. goes on. So if they fix the prime issue, right, which we think is both uh, an easy fix, but if they fix the prime issue, the next thing that I would want them to address is the minions. They need to uh, fix the minions pathing. They need to fix the minions health. They need to fix the minions damage. Um, they need, they need their minions to feel smart and, and, and active on the map, or they need to come out and say, that's not a priority on our game. We want things to be more like a Heroes of the Storm type game where, right. yes, you need minions to farm and get XP. Well, okay, if that's the case, make it global farm and make it global XP like they did in Heroes of the Storm. They made yeah. it a priority that that wasn't, that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted people to be team fighting. They wanted everybody as close to an equal footing as possible. Okay, fine. If that's what you want. That's fine. Heroes of the Storm was a good game. I mean, it failed to meet expectations, I think, for like a Blizzard product, but it was still a good game. It's definitely a cool idea for a MOBA. Um, and, and again, if, if that's where Overprime is wanting to lean more towards is not so much like this over the top, like stratagem game where you have to be managing waves and, you know, counting your CS and, you know, are you doing this amount, this amount? Like if they don't want that, that's fine. That's okay. I'm okay with a chill MOBA style game. Um, but just be open about that. That's what you want. And so, uh, and make adjustments that match that and make sure that the players are, are aware of it. Cause otherwise I think we end up with what you talked about where, you have one idea of like you know the old school Paragon players wanting to come in play over Prime and being basically bombarded with this over the top team deathmatch style gameplay, and new players who have only maybe watched a couple of YouTube videos and have no idea what's going on, uh, and then they're getting their nexus cracked at eight minutes. Like that's right. also not a good feel. So, uh, I'm kind of with <laughs> you on the minions, but I want the minions to start just as strong as they are now, but I want them to increase in power as, 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 as time goes by. Cause I liked having, being able to play around the minions. I think that opens up a lot of strategy. Um, sure. something I would do a lot is clear out the range minions because the melee minions can't reach you if you're weaving around, you know? So mm -hmm. if you clear out the enemy's range minions and they don't clear out yours, then you have an advantage. Sure. I thought that was fun, but, um, the minions just didn't do anything to the towers. Uh, again, no. it's like, here's the storm. The minions were there to, for you to get gold, and get enough XP to get your ultimate. Once you mm -hmm. have your ultimate, it's rotate time. That like that's how here's the storm works. You stay sure. in lane. Everybody gets their their stuff until they get yep. their ultimate, and then it's time to roam together as a team and take objectives. And that's exactly how Overprime works. And um, I don't know how many times I, I said it during the the match too. Was like the minions don't matter. Like people be like oh defend left lane, defend left lane. It's like that that minion wave is not going to do shit. Just leave it. No, like it's not no. going to push that inhibitor by itself. Um, no. And, like, people just dying for towers. It's like, don't die for a tower. The tower's not that important. Right. It's, the towers are usually important because that get, that's what gets your minions. If you take that tower out, you can get this minion wave pushing into their inhibitor. Didn't matter. Didn't matter at Overprime. It was more about the team fights and the objectives. Uh, people just couldn't get it through their, through their heads on that. But I do think the minions, it would be a more interesting game if the minions were more effective. And you could employ strategies that involved, you know, setting a push and having that push do something for you and distracting mm -hmm. the enemy team away while you're doing something else. Like, force people to have to back to defend those lanes. Because right now, sure. people were only backing to defend lanes because that's what they thought they were supposed to do in a MOBA. Right. Not because they had to. I, and I agree with that. I mean, I know for us, once we, you know, again, in our five stack, once we had that that idea, we only knew we needed one tower, especially once the buff had came through. We only need one tower, and that was the the um, the duo lane tower. And the reason why you need the duo lane tower is because eventually you need to do the the prime dunk, and it's easier to do. You don't technically need the lane; you can right. go through the jungler. But if we have the lane down, it makes it way easier for you to be able to approach the dunk uh, spot with a little bit more strategy, right? That was only, that was really the only one. Pre taking the prime, it was just like, get as much golden experience as you can. So that way we're at least as strong as possible. And let's go and, and kill the prime and try and end the game. Um, right. and, and that was it. Like, so everything else about the game became, you know, almost minuscule. It didn't matter at all. Uh, and, and I do think that that's a problem. Um, but I actually, so this kind of, re I guess, leans me to a question for you is, where do you want Overprime to fit in your games, I guess? Like, what, what are you wanting Overprime to be? Like, are you uh, in the camp that you want it to be a full-on Paragon successor, or do you want it to be its own thing? And if it is its own thing, what are you hoping at the end result when, let's say, all the betas, all the alphas, all the testing, all this stuff is done and they're releasing a game, what is it that 
Mangus will be like, this is the game I wanted. <laughs> well, it's not exactly an easy answer. What mm-hmm. I would say is I want each company, each Paragon remake, to pick a route and stick with it, to stick with their vision for what they want their game to be. If mm-hmm. Overprime wants to be a more of a Heroes of the Storm brawler, team brawler mm-hmm. with MOBA elements, then go full force into that. Like, commit to that and be that. And be the best at that that you can be. If you're the best at that that you can be, then I'll play that game. If pre- sure. Predecessor seems to be going more along the route of just straight up traditional Paragon, if they mm-hmm. can be the best at being the most traditional Paragon, then that's what I'm going to play. Like, I... I'll play as many of them as I can. Like, at fault, they're trying to be, like, like a more advanced version of Paragon. Like, if mm-hmm. they're kind of trying to be the Dota of of, of the uh, third-person MOBAs. And if they can do that, and if they can make it fun, then, then awesome. I won't have time to play everything, but I will say that I enjoyed the Overprime CBT enough that I, I, I'm pretty sure I would play it. Even if it meant just, like, a couple games a day. Like, I mm-hmm. still play Heroes of the Storm, but I'll play, like, one or two games a day and move mm-hmm. on. Like, I would still play Overprime just a couple days a game, a couple games a day, and then, you know, move over to Predecessor. Or sure. if Fault becomes really good, then move over to Fault, whatever. But sure. I just want them to pick a route and stick with it. I, I, think, I like that answer. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and I'm right there with you, essentially, answering my own question. I, I think that, you know, yeah, identity is huge. Um, I know for me... Over Prime of the ones that I've played, so I didn't get to play Predecessor, but I did play um, a decent amount of Fault, um, and I did play uh, way back in the day on PlayStation, I played a lot of Paragon. Um, Over Prime in this test was so much fun, especially before the buffs. Like, um, I, Not that the buffs, I think, were a... a you know, a bad marker, but it definitely changed the way that we were playing the game. Um, and But just leading up into that change... I was just having a blast. I, I, I just really, I don't know what it was about it, but just something clicked a little bit more to where I'm at in my gaming. I'm, I'm a little bit of an older guy, you know, we, we both are, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't have, I don't have the insane amount of time that it takes to, uh, you know, dedicate to crazy amounts of hours and, you know, to become, I'm not looking to go pro in one of these games. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I, I want to have fun. I want to be able to log in with my friends. I want to be able to play and I want to, and, and over prime, did that for me like there was very few times where um because we all knew that it was only for a short time so we all kind of wanted to play it but i didn't feel obligated to play just because it was only for a short time like i wanted to log in every day i couldn't wait for like jelly to get off of work so we could all log in and like is mangoose coming in oh now he's playing with his other team oh that loser (laughs) you know like that kind of stuff like we were all really excited to get our chance to play a little bit more and try new things and do stuff and um and i don't know if it's just because it was the new version of it or what, but I, I just had fun. And, and that's to your, 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 your uh, mentioning is that it's, I want to have fun with the game and, but I want to know what the game is expected to be for fun. Like, again, if it's a par- full on Paragon successor and you liked that and that's what you want for fun, then, then you should pick one of the ones that's way more of a Paragon successor. And if you're looking for more of like, you know, a little bit more silly or fast paced, um, you know, that's like going between, uh, you know, Apex and, you know, Call of Duty or whatever. Like, you can have multiple versions of a, of a game style work very well. You just have to make sure that your audience is aware of what it is that you're you're going into. And right. um, th- and that's what I'm hoping to see again from Overprime or any of these companies is to make an identity, challenge the, the current king of these third-person MOBAs, which is Smite. Which, by the way, I've played a lot of Smite. I don't think Smite's all that good. I think Smite's just the only one in the market that that captured an audience and and does well. Now, is Smite a terrible game? No, no, no. Don't get me wrong. Don't come after me, Smite guys. I think Smite's a fine game. But I don't think that they captured the essence that we all fell in love with the first time we played Paragon. Right. I think Smite just happened to be the only one that maintained. And they had a really good gimmick going for them, right? Getting to play gods is always cool. And they captured that environment and they made it good. And they have a bunch of different modes and all that stuff. And the skins look pretty decent and the voice lines are good. Um, so Smite's not a bad game. But I don't think that Smite really captured what I want in a third-person MOBA. You know, when I think of, like playing that i I wanted something more like what paragon kind of started um and we can i don't want to go down too deep on what failed paragon i think i mean there's a lot of different you know ideas you know so whether it's uh epic games or paragon just failing to to video in and of itself yeah (laughs) yeah no kidding um but yeah so i I agree with you identity is the biggest thing um for these guys and i i really liked at least the 
idea of the identity of over prime um if it's a the you know hot's version of you know a third person moba that's fine like, I, I just want to know what it is that i'm right. getting myself into uh you know smite teamed up with slipknot they're gonna have slipknot skins in smite i i saw that i think in your <laughs> discord and um i was like wait who does that help more i'm trying to figure it out like is is somebody on the slipknot team like a fan of it has smite, to be or? that has to, it has imagine. to be that yeah, like, I, but do you know what though? Smite does all kinds of stuff. They did, uh, they, they they did, they did uh, Ruby. They did Ninja yep. Turtles. They did yep. all kind, yeah, all kinds yeah. of shit, man. Bob um, Ross. They had a Bob Ross skin for Zelda's. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know about the Bob Ross one. Uh, they oh, they did the Last Airbender guys, right? They so they did. Yeah, yeah. Dude, they've they've done a lot. They're like um, freaking Fortnite of of getting people to join in on their team and yeah, just no, skins. Right. It's crazy. Uh, and then you and, got and Soul Leave. Then you got Soul Leave. <laughs> Uh, teaming up with Metaverse Entertainment to bring digital Instagram models into their game, which is weird as all hell. I don't know who they're appealing to for that one. I, <laughs> yeah, a... I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, let's move on to another problem. And um, this is probably the biggest one that the community probably talked about, which which was balance. And I mm-hmm. think that there was a lot of balance issues, but I think a lot of them, I think people got wrong. Like, so okay. many people I saw out there saying Revenant was overpowered. I didn't think Revenant was overpowered at all. Me neither. No. Like, there were items to counter Revenant. You had the stasis item, which Revenant mm-hmm. would ult me. I would stasis. He would waste his entire kit on mm-hmm. a, an inanimate object, and yep. then, I, then I would kill him. And it just seemed to me that in every game, it, was, it wasn't it was the Revenants that were popping off. It would end up being the Scud or the Twin Blast or... Mm-hmm. In a really long game, Sparrow, but it had to be a very long game for Sparrow to really kind of pop off. Come online. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, Revenant, he was certainly powerful in the right hands and at, at, at the right time, but I didn't think he was overpowered at all. And I think that's, again, people just not, not enough items to counter stuff like that, and people not using the items that were there in order to counter him. Uh, Gideon, mm-hmm. I think, was way overpowered. Um, there was definitely some over overpowered stuff in the game that people just seem to not notice. Like Steel's shield, the one that mm-hmm. he throws down in the lane that blocks projectiles yeah. and slows you. That thing was overpowered as all fuck and it and for, so and for the wrong reasons. In Overprime, and this is another problem they need to address, mm-hmm. projectiles, um, whether it's projectile or hit scan, whatever, the origin is behind your hero. The mm-hmm. origin of that projectile is behind your hero, so you could be standing in front of Steel's shield and still have still have your yep. projectiles blocked. Mm-hmm. Um, back in way way back before they even got picked up by Netmarble, that was a big problem I had with the game. Is you could actually see the projectiles come behind, go through your hero, and like coming it, through your like shoulder or whatever, yeah, and then yeah, hit your target. Your, but yeah. yeah, that's that Steel Shield was overpowered for all the wrong reasons. Uh, uh, Gideon overpowered. Um, because his ultimate, if you got sucked into the center of it, even ranged heroes, you couldn't aim directly upwards to hit him. Yep. Like, either I, change I, Gideon's ultimate somehow, mm-hmm. or make it to where you can look straight up. I don't, I guess there might be a problem with being able to just loop right on over if you aim straight up. I, I have no idea. I, well, I definitely agree with you. Um, it, it's a it's a mixed bag for me um, it, that... The things that were overpowered uh, that from the community, I sometimes questioned whether that was just because you didn't know how to counteract them. Like, you don't know the outplay potential versus the actual overpoweredness um, and uh, or things that were, like, unintentionally strong. Um, I think the, the shield uh, from Scott, for example, was unintentionally strong. Like, I don't think that that's what the, the game is designed to necessarily do. Um, but there were moments where I feel, I feel like in the hands of certain individuals, some champions just felt insanely strong and hard to play against. And there was no, almost no outplay for you. Um, whereas other ones, uh, uh, again, Revenant, I don't think he was that strong. I think that he has potential to be strong, but the player that is playing as the Revenant really needs to understand and pick their targets well. Um, I think once the game goes towards a team fight, they're not nearly as strong as they should be. Um, there's two items that you can buy that don't hurt your kit very well to basically get rid of his, his ultimate on you. Um, I think in the solo queue environment, Revenant probably was popping up and just doing 
insane amounts of because yeah. basically he just was uh in, in the right hands he could become ungankable right if he because he'll just turn the lights off on one person and make it to where it's a 1v1 and hopefully he's far enough ahead and he wins right um and i, I just outside of that though he has no escape ability he has he has no knockbacks he has no he has no cc he has a slow on his e and um, everything else is like you know his the the missiles they're not like scuds it's not point and click they spread out so yeah. the only time his missile is really that efficient is if it's in the one on one environment inside of his ultimate more more particularly so I think once people realize that you could one you can run away from him in his ultimate you can literally go as far away as you want to um, you don't have to stay up in there and try and fight him so if you are a mobile champion you can just run away he, he, right. what is he gonna do. Nothing. So I, I think it just came down to maybe people not understanding how Revenant works. Now, again, to the Gideon perspective, that that one... Uh, so Gideons, I feel like, are probably the hardest one to balance around, right? Because you want him to be an efficient, you know, powerful mage that, that, that does what he's supposed to do. Uh, and then in the hands of somebody who's really experienced, that's going to look really bad. Uh, I do agree with the game mechanic of when he, they get sucked into the middle, um, you not being able to do anything is is a bit of a feels bad. Um, I would argue that maybe there's outplay potential in the fact that you maybe have a blink item um, or something along those lines that you can use to kind of disengage from his ult. Um, and so it's hard to say exactly whether or not, you know, the, the team will want that to be an, an impactful yeah. thing that, hey, if I land my ult really well, I shouldn't be punished and have them shooting up into my butthole. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like I landed a beautiful, perfect ult and they can't shoot me. I should be maybe rewarded for that ability or game. Right. Um, I, I think then if that's the case, they should remove the height at which he can cast his ultimate. Um, because make, it a cir- a... make it a circle, make it a sphere instead of, yeah. a, instead of a cylinder. Exactly, because yeah. uh, there were a few times uh, that w- the guy was just, you know, uh, it's so high up there. I'm not even surp- I'm surprised that the game didn't have a ceiling at that point of that, how high he was <laughs> able to reach. Um, it was nutty to me. But, um, yeah, so from that perspective, I think he, there are some, some, some tweakings, some things that maybe they make it to where it doesn't fully suck you into the, 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 the middle. It kind of gives you like a little bit of like a eye of the storm out the, that you can only go into that far or something to where you could still have opportunities to look up. Um, as far as the mechanics of being able to look straight up versus not, I don't know what those would be like. Yeah, and maybe somebody who's more of a programmer can comment on that. But um, yeah, I, I think a lot of the overpoweredness, way more times were just people not understanding the kits or not understanding their potential for outplay. Um, I know for me as like, you know, going up against uh, Kalaris as Scud, it was so frustrating feeling like I could never get rid of her. And Jelly made, made a mention. He's like, well, when do you use your shotgun blast to knock her away? I was like, I almost, almost immediately. Well, there yeah. you go. Because as soon as you do that, I just wait and I go in and then and like, and you're, now you're dead again. And I'm like, oh, well, that's dumb and obvious. But I, in the heat of the moment, you just like, ah, oh, there's somebody on top of me. Right click, get away. Now they're on top of me again. And so it's like, it's a mixture of having outplay also kits like, you know, some, you know, Bora should be able to be really sticky and, and, you know, and be hard to get rid of. That's part of her kit and her design. Um, but th- I just think that again, it comes down to balancing out like, what's the outplay of that? If the Bora is like over the top strong, which she was, I think if we're yeah. talking overpowered, I think Bora was probably the most overpowered she champion in that game. She, she had all the healing damage point and click <laughs> point and click abilities um you know and, and she's the sexiest of all you know so she took down you know <laughs> my favorite girl countess as the sexiest in the game um but no well honestly she she was just really really difficult to deal with even on coordinated good teams i mean i like to think that we were really trying okay hey we know we need to focus on bora well there's not a lot of hard cc in this game there's really not and so it's hard to deal with somebody who's that sticky that fast and does that much damage and has healing bamp like yeah. what do you what do you, what do you do unless you're just so far ahead and can all laser focus on her before she can kill your carries and or your whole team maybe um so i think that's something that they need to look at is uh is some of the cc aspects of the game too and how right now with the champions that we currently have now i know that they have a probably a roadmap of when they're going to release other champions and some of those champions will have more you know hard cc but like I mean, before um, Narbash was in there, what hard CC was there really to deal with with Bora? 
You know, I mean, Narbash, even then he still has to land his, yeah. you know, his, his stick to be able to even do a hard CC or his knockup. But I, I don't know. There's maybe two abilities in the rest of the game that it did was hard CC on her. I mean, you had Steel, Muriel, uh, Bellica. The, she couldn't get out of Pond's root. I, I will I will say, um, and I, I was going to come around to this oh, anyway. I'm, yeah, was, um a lot of the a lot of the heroes were very rock paper scissors. Like one hero would just completely counter another hero, and the, <laughs> so, and the example I'm thinking of here is for I don't I'm really not sure why Phase shit on Bora so hard. Like any time I was facing a Bora and I was a Phase, just deleted her. Just really like it was nothing. Maybe it's because I was blinding them and they didn't know where to stand <laughs> to hit me with their wolves or or whatever, but like. And, or pulling them in to interrupt their dash or something. I don't know what it was, but FaZe destroyed Bora. And I think a lot of the times, like, if you're playing Bora and all of a sudden you just get destroyed by a FaZe and there's and it feels like there's zero outplay for it, mm-hmm. then you're going to think that FaZe is overpowered. Sure. Or, you know, uh, if you're playing um, uh, let's, uh, Bellica, for example, her mm-hmm. ultimate would absolutely wreck late game. So... Mm-hmm. Gideon was obviously overpowered, but if you're thinking, if if, if you're a Gideon and you face a a, a Valora, a Bellica, whatever you want to call her, in sure. late game he, sh- you use one ability and then you're dead just because yeah. she she lock on ulted you, you're going to think that Valora is massively overpowered. Um, I, I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I know for, with Valora for, as a carry, it was the same thing. I was always low on mana as an AD carry. You know what I mean? Because you're spamming your abilities, and they cost a lot when you're an AD carry, and you don't buy mana items, so you're usually pretty low on mana, especially during a team fight. And I would all of a, I'd be popping off, and then all of a sudden, poof, just dead. I'd be like, oh, yeah. I got, I got ulted. Okay, well, sucks it wasn't to be like me. she had to combo you. No, she hits R, and I died. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, because <laughs> she does a lot of damage, uh, and, and I will argue I don't think that like having rock paper scissors in the game is necessarily bad, right? I think a lot of the the mobas that we've played in the in the past or any games that ha- have this do offer a bit of a rock paper scissors, like and so the argument would be okay. So if I'm if I'm in a, a disadvantageous matchup, right? So uh, you know they're they're going to kick my butt all game long. Okay, so what do I as the player do to make meaningful impact somewhere else? Like, that's what you're taught, in, at least for League of Legends and almost any other MOBA that I've played. It's right. like, okay, so you're going to get your buy handed to you in this game? Then don't be here. Do get your farm. Hopefully you can push up the lane and go somewhere else. Get your the rest of your team. Help your jungler with ganks. Help your offlaner. Help your carries. Get somewhere else. Do something else. Make your your presence felt in a place that you can still have an impact. Um, and I think with the, the player base as it is now, especially in a solo queue environment... Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to feel like, oh, I can't win my matchup, or I'm, uh, right. you know, it's either, either I'm so good I'm gonna outplay the the matchup that's di- you know disadvantageous for me, or I'm gonna play and beat my head into this wall because I don't want to play it any other way, and I don't want to help anyone else. That's not what I'm here for. I want to play in my lane because I picked mid lane. I want to <laughs> go there, and 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 I think that that's a part of like you know, um, leading into what I would say the next major issue is the toxicity of understanding your your role in a game like this and understanding you know from a community perspective of what you are meant to do to help your team overall win the game you don't always have to be the carry to win your games in fact in our games more times than not our jungler jelly was carrying us through most of the games because he would take advantage of what he could do he was always ganking he was always farming and he just knew and understood his role and we all as a group said hey this works Let's well, just set this up. He would carry unless I was with the team, and then, <laughs> then I would carry a mid lane. Yeah. <laughs> no, I will. I will say the one of the one of the things that you can use to counter that rock paper scissors matchup, which Overprime didn't have, and I mentioned this right off the top. We're bringing it right back around. Items. Um, yep. 100%. Itemization. That's the itemization. The poor itemization factored into the poor balance of the game. Because you couldn't counterpick items against certain heroes. Big so, true. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all like it all comes together, right? Exactly what you're saying. So if if okay, so if minions were a little bit more uh, efficient, if items were more efficient, if the overall balance in the champions felt like this, then 
obviously the game would be a lot better, but then you wouldn't have this YouTube video. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, exactly. So thank you. So leave, you know, another another thing I think that contributed to the balance to the poor balance of the game was the randomness of the prime spirit buff. Oh, you didn't like that. Well, I mean, if you think about it, if you put, if you pick Narbash and you get, and you get the, uh, the water spirit, you're like, sweet. All of a sudden, your Narbash is way more powerful, but you have zero control. You and the enemy team have zero control whether you get that water spirit or not. Whereas Mm -hmm. if you're playing Bellica and the enemy team gets the water spirit, you're like, well, fuck. Now they're going to be all full up on mana all the time because they have the water spirit. So that kind of played a little bit of a part into it, I think. I know, no, I definitely agree with you that it that it played a part. Um, it was a, it this, was so fun though that I don't want them to get rid of it. Like, I like that that spirit was was random and would give you random buffs. I, and well, and I think that was part of it too. Is like I know in a few of our games we had it to where we got two of the buffs or something like that that we were like stoked for that helped our comp right. And but we also had moments, and so this is my counter to you is that it's like there was also times oh they just got that buff. That means that this idea or this con- that, you know thing that we were going to do is going to be slightly more difficult, and we would game plan around it. Like we would try to think outside the box on that. Or um, there was a moment where we were trying to debate between getting the buff or going to prime, and we we all made the decision. We're like, you know what, that buff doesn't help us here. Let's just go to prime instead, or let's do something else yeah. on the map. So um, I, I don't I I do like the idea of all of the different you know buffs um and, and the tuning i think is something that they'll have to look at and see um because I, I i don't have enough games um and i didn't write down the impact that it had on all the numbers and all that stuff to see um but you know i'm hoping that they do and they look at it and say like okay so you know this one was a little bit over tuned and gave this much advantage and we want that to be you know scaled back and um and this isn't the first time that we've seen something similar to this like you know so heroes of the storm had their version of different random buffs um league of legends has their their drakes that, that all spawn different ones um, and have their various benefits. And so um, I do agree that having another thing that you as the dev have to balance around is a bit of a complication. While a cool mechanic, it does make questionable, like, again, okay, well, we can't buff Narbash because if he gets two, you know, uh, this spirit buffs, he will be too strong with these changes. Right. And, and so when you're starting to try and, like, do this against potentially rng aspects plus still the players making their impact on it with items um i I do feel like it can create a big complication um i don't think i've really felt it too much in the game um there were moments on some of the longer games where like god dude they just are (laughs) never out of mana or they're just always so tanky like we had that one where there was a um their jungler was just tanky out of his mind and i was full build all armor shredding items, going back to itemization, there was not enough items in there to deal with this guy. But we had all five of us attacking him, and he had a Muriel just full shields. He had full shields from his items, and he just was unkillable. He was just a raid boss into himself, and we yeah. couldn't do anything about it. And that's a feels bad. Like there, So it does have an impact, but um, I, I think that the mechanic itself is, is cool. I just They need to make sure that having it doesn't negate from the other bigger picture items like if it's a nice like small buff that gives you a little bit makes it worth it to take it because it should be yeah um that's fine um but i don't want it to be the decider on whether or not a team wins or loses because they you know got three fire buffs in a row and right. and you didn't I, um, I would like yeah that's what i'd like to see is it less likely to stack so I, I know one example um a game i was playing um i think it was with bearded and windu and them we had three water spirits, like three mm-hmm. water spirits spawned in a row. We got all three and we had three water spirits. That's six mm-hmm. percent fucking mm-hmm. health and mana regen every five seconds. That's, that's stupid. That, yeah, that that's is, too much. Yeah. Uh, I know for I for leak they do it to where like um now their whole system is probably way different, but they do it where um you can have multiples. Um, but like, there's like a lower percentage chance that once you have the one that the next one will come in of the same type, um, not in an impossibility, but it does lower. And and I could be okay with that. Like, so you will have games maybe where like 
it's all you know yeah water spirits and you're just like dude that's crazy we won the jackpot <laughs> um but again i also think that there's also something to be said and and um i'm hopeful that you know in a more competitive environment as the game gets to where it's going is you will have teams understanding and gaming around that like hey it's another water spirit they got the first one we can't let them have that one we have to be there for that team fight we have right. to be involved in that to make sure that they don't get it well what are we going to give up in that to make that team fight happen um Right now, there's not a lot you give up because minion waves don't matter. But if they did, all of a sudden those those questions and again turning the game from checkers into chess starts to pop up of like what can we do to prevent this snowball from happening? But what can they do to make that you know the us reducing their snowball worse for us? Right? right. But obviously we don't have that in the game. So it's <laughs> <laughs> that, those again are are the compounding effects I think of of, of the first uh, few that we touched on. But um, I, I like the idea. Going back to your initial thing, I do like the idea. You just make sure that it's implemented correctly. Yeah. Well, in the interest of brevity, let's each give one more example of things that we want them to improve in Overprime, and then we'll we'll start closing out this video. Even though there's probably way more stuff, and oh, let us gosh. and guys, let us know if we miss something. Let us know in the comments, um, and uh, hope we can get a good conversation going over Please. that. Um, I have one in mind. Do you have one in mind or no? I do. Yeah, I've, I've got one. Okay, go for you, it. You want me to go? Okay, so this one is going to be a little bit more at you guys. Um, one of the things that was driving me crazy, and I know it drew, drew the guys crazy, was the, the, the unnecessary toxicity from the community itself. Oh, God, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was so disappointed because this is literally probably the lowest stakes version of a MOBA game that you can have. It's literally in a closed beta. There's no competitive. There's no ranked. You don't earn any extra rewards. You don't you, literally all the skins. You can buy them with the currency that they give you. Like there's nothing there other than just, you know, trying to learn the game and have fun and, and win as many of them as you can, which I get you want to win. But like the way that I would see players treating other players who were obviously new was just so disappointing. Um, you know, reading like the comments and the in, in in the different um, forums and seeing like how just mean people were uh, about you know this game was just to me was a big disappointment. I I was really really surprised by that, and and I just don't see the point in it. Like for the most of us, mo the average gamer, none of us are going to become pros if Overprime becomes right. like this really big thing, gets as big as let's say Smite or League of Legends even or whatever. Not, most people who are watching me talk right now, you are not going to become a pro at this game. You are not. You might be challenging for some of the maybe, you know, middle to the top spots, let's say, but you're not going to become a pro. So why act like somehow this other player who's just trying to do their best is preventing you from reaching something? Like you, you what you should be doing is looking and saying, hey, how can I help this guy get better? Right. If, if I have knowledge to him pass... Hey, man, I noticed that on this, you use this instead of that. And I'm just telling you, this will probably help you. Or, hey, I saw this video that Mangoose put out. You should go check it out. It goes over, like, how to play your, your character in this way or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, let's be a, a force of, of positivity in this space because being negative costs you more games than it helps you. Because what yeah. are you going to do? You're going to put that guy on the defensive. He's not going to want to listen to your callouts. He's, not, he's just going to do his own thing anyway. So why even go down that path? And so I think... From that perspective, um, I, I would like to see the Overprime team step in. I think that they need to do a better tutorial. Um, and when we mentioned this in the last video, I think a lot of these types of, of games can do better by setting people up for success and understanding the, the, the complexities of a MOBA. Um, not everybody comes into it and understanding wave management and ganking and, you know, neutral camps and all this stuff. Like, even if, like I said, the simplest way would just to have videos, but even if it's something that they do a playthrough on, like, you know, understanding game timings or any or terminologies like that, I think it would set up the newer player base to be a little bit more effective and maybe the veterans wouldn't have to feel like they're hand-holding people as much. But it was just really, really disappointing in this environment in, in particular. This isn't even a launch yeah. game. It's not in ranked play. It's not even ranked play. It's literally for fun, quick play against who knows who <laughs> with nothing on the table other than your time and you getting to play the game in closed beta. I, I just don't understand. Somebody's ego, I, was, I was blown away. Sometimes people's egos can't take a loss. They just can't I take know. a loss. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I will say solely did a pretty good job of managing a lot of that. Like, um, like they were banning people left and right. And it wasn't just mm. for what my problem was going to be, which was hacking, but 
<laughs> but they were banning people for toxicity left and right and for AF and for like leaving over and over again. Sure. The lever penalty, the first instance of leaving was 30 minutes. Yeah. Which, you know, kind of fucked some people over because I, I know like a, at least one guy, he, um, like his power went out or he got disconnected or something and then he, he reconnected to the game, played it out and still got a 30 minute lever penalty. Oh, did he? Oh, so, I think if you reconnect, obviously that should go away. But I mean, yeah, I, I did. I was happy about that part. They do. They were like for the really egregious stuff. I think, you know, people using expletives that were uh, obviously have no place in gaming, um, you know, making sex remarks and stuff like that. Like none of, none of that is, is valuable to any you know community. And I think that I loved and we talked about this in the last video. I loved how proactive they were in showing oh, God, hey, yeah. this 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 name this person because you even knew somebody who knew one of the guys were like oh I, I reported that guy and now I see him on this band list like that's massive like that's a really good thing um I still think that they as the team can do more and and have more of an impact on improving it and again this was closed beta so they do have plenty of time to kind of do some of those stuff but uh, it was more of like just the self governing you know of the players themselves of just like immediately like going to what I would consider like the most toxic way of approaching playing in a, in a community game. Uh, it just felt like they, they, just, they went the, the I mean, it's not all people were bad actors. In fact, most people probably just didn't even talk, but there were enough that I noticed it consistently yeah. that I was just like, what is going on here? So that was my last one. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, but my last one was, and solely did crack down on this quite a bit, but I don't mm -hmm. understand how it happened in the first place was all the hackers. Um, yeah. They have like a channel in their Discord where people could report hackers. Holy mm -hmm. shit, is it hilarious? And I kind of want to go through and record some of that stuff <laughs> and make a video. Because you got like Murdoch just firing his ultimate over and over and over again. Like, no pause, just sniping people from his core. Then mm -hmm. you've got Sparrow just basic attacking people from, from, from her fountain and killing people in lane. You got the one that I posted with the Gideon machine gun. Yep. Um, you got speed hacks all over the place that I haven't seen that in any of the other Paragon remakes. And you would think with as prevalent as it was in the overprime test that it would be more mm. prevalent in those. Um, maybe it's just because they had so many people like they had more people, I think, than they I mean, they, they started with 15,000 that first day. But I mean, sure. pre predecessor had a massive audience for, for their last stress test. And mm -hmm. they, I, I didn't see anybody hacking in predecessor. And I certainly, maybe somebody or other complained about it, or, but that a lot of times that's just people thinking it was a hack when it's actually just somebody being really good or what have you. But sure. there were definite, very obvious hacks in Overprime and they need to get a handle on that. I don't know what they could do with their coding or they had their, was it easy anti cheat or whatever? They need right. something to 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 put a halt on that. And again, the stakes are so low. Why <laughs> hack this game? Like, yeah, I, I I feel blessed that I didn't encounter any hackers that I know of in my game. There were a few that I felt like were a little questionable, but um, again, that could just come down to where it was just uh them understanding mechanics and movement and stuff like that better than than I was expecting them to. Um, I, you know, I think when you're around in the gaming sphere for a while you start to kind of get a bit of an instinct for stuff like you could be like that just seems odd and weird and you know and i'll always encourage anybody like if you feel like it was something maybe it was report it let the, the, the devs figure it out they have stuff in place it's not on you to be calling them out and trying to to you know make it into a, a tiktok clip or something like that but um yeah the blatant cheating thing was super weird uh the only thing i can think of is that in some cases like um, being that we had a worldwide um, test that there are known servers that where cheating is tends to be a bit more aggressive um, and almost looked upon as like a positive aspect of you win in any way, in any causes. Um, and so maybe because Overprime has a good chance to capture an audience in those areas, they uh, the people who could benefit from it, the hackers who I'm talking about, the people who can benefit from selling these hacks were using this beta as a way to say, hey, we know how to hack this game. Hey, we know how to make you <laughs> unkillable and do all these things. Um, and then there's also, I think, something that we might not have seen in our community um, too much, but maybe is in another community of people being trolls, 
just wanting to ruin yeah. people's games. It's a free to play, you know, beta and they could just get in there. They knew they were going to get banned, but they could get maybe five or 10 games in using these cheats and, and make, you know, videos about it and laugh to them and their idiotic friends about how cool they are and how edgy they are being able to go in there and <laughs> ruin the fun of these guys. But um, I, I obviously we're hopeful that, that that won't be something that, that comes to fruition later on. Um, but th- those would be my guesses. But yeah, it was it's dumb. I don't understand, especially like you said, the, lo- the lowest of low stakes. There's literally no benefit. You, you get everything. All the skins are free. There was no real MMR. <laughs> There's no no ranks. None of that stuff. It was literally like the most for fun you can really have in a in a game like this. I, I don't I don't know. It makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> all right. Well, let's start wrapping this up. Uh, do you have anything? Just any final thoughts you want to throw out there, Viking? Before we um out. you know honestly i think the, we touched on so many of the the aspects uh i really loved the tournament i thought the tournament was a really good eye opener for for kind of seeing some of the the benefits of you know um communication and um different you know game styles like you know warding and all that stuff like there's th- i think what i'm most excited for to, to try and keep it brief is the the potential of this game i feel like that the potential has a really really high ceiling um i again i really i had a lot of fun i'm i'm excited to see what ranked could look like in a game like this i'm excited to see what they can do with you know um figuring out their identity as far as like how they want minions to work and um you know the balance around the, the neutral objectives and you know all that fun stuff i i am a- extremely excited about this one um I'm I'm still of the mindset that like you know I don't think the Paragon was a perfect game and so going back to just another Paragon won't be beneficial or it won't capture a major audience. I think Overprime has an opportunity because of its differences to capture a wider audience, you know, and and maybe steal some of the audience from people who play Smite, for example, but don't want to play the normal Smite. They want to play more of the the team deathmatch type of Smite. Yeah. Or uh, League of Legends players who like playing MOBAs but don't like the the style that League does it. Um, or the first person, third person shooter, you know, uh, players who want to play something like taking Call of Duty and putting it into a MOBA style. And, you know, I think Overprime can capture all those different types of players. Um, will they do so? I mean, that's up to them to decide. But I, <laughs> I think they have the the potential to do so and and I'm excited to see if they are able to. Yeah, 100%. Um, and again, guys, if we didn't touch on something that you think that Overprime could improve, there's a lot of stuff. There's stuff that I can think of right now, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> yeah, just let, us, let us know in the comments below, and uh, and we'll talk about it. And uh, once, once I get all the comments and everything we've talked about today, I'm going to put that into a big list of feedback and get that over to Soul Leave. So that they know what the community is thinking. But uh, yeah, uh, Viking Jedi, I'll have your YouTube and Twitch link down below. What's the last time you did a YouTube video? Uh, it's been like a year since I've done a YouTube <laughs> video. Uh, I, you know, I just, it's it's one of those things, and I'm sure people in your audience can relate. I, I just feel like um, the market is sometimes so saturated with people trying to make content and I never felt like my content was all that great to begin with. Um, but I'm happy to be part of content. I, I like, the, <laughs> I, I like, so this is my thing and I don't want to take up a whole lot of time, but I think a lot of uh, of your audience and you will probably relate to this, but I, I'm a, a, an old school gamer guy. Like I remember the days of sitting next to my buddies at their house or at my house where, you know, we're both playing super Mario brothers or, you know, Zelda or, you know, final fantasy or something like that. And your victories were just as much my victories and my victories were just as much your victories and you make something happen and you're stoked and you're excited and that's what I love about making content or at least being part of content um, and so like getting a chance to do stuff like this you know and interact and do those things like that's what that's what I thrive for uh, I haven't had a, found a way to do so efficiently through my own content but uh, maybe if I do uh, you guys will see another <laughs> video pop up uh, but in the meantime I'm very happy to be part of stuff like this and, and uh, whatever we end up doing in the future because uh, it is a lot of fun and, and I like being part of it right on well i'm happy to have you but that is going to close out the video for this week again guys if you want updates on all of the different paragon remakes uh please subscribe to my channel because i try my best to give the most unbiased coverage as possible and if you like this video go ahead and hit that like button for us but for now this is mangoose and the viking jedi signing off oh i can't even do that (laughs) you guys have a good one (laughs) mangoose 
Special shout out to channel members I Bloodhunter, Jelly Knees, Meow Mix for Men, Stunt, Raven, and Blastoise King.